Hopefully it's not too loud back there. <laughs> Y'all hear me? <laughs> okay, um, I'm moderating this session this afternoon, so I'll go ahead and introduce myself to those of you who don't know me, probably most of you do. Um, Mike Westendorf, I work for Rutgers University as an animal science specialist, and I am active there. I do a lot of work with animal waste management, um, nutrient management, help our farmers, horse farmers, livestock farmers any way I can in terms of dealing with environmental issues related to animal waste. Well, this afternoon I'm going to talk about some best management practices on, on equine farms, and, and I'm going to have a number of slides or quite a number of pictures for you, uh, and I'm going to call them the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> some are pretty good, some are not so bad. There's just a few that are downright ugly. So I'm not to point figures at anybody, but we're all trying to work together towards the same goal on this. Okay, um, you've, those of you who are involved probably know or you're finding out that uh, our equine group, our regional, have a regional project group, um, Northeast 1441, uh, a project about environmental impacts of equine operations. If you're involved with an experiment station or a university or land grant institution, you probably know about uh, regional projects and this project's been going for about five years. We have participants from um, throughout the Northeast and throughout the country, probably 12 to 15 states are represented as, as participants in this project. We have a number of uh, objectives. I'll just zip through these uh, very quickly. Pasture and grazing management, manure storages, feeding management practices, stable housing and design, and uh, other best management practices. So we are involved in a, a number of things, and if you're interested in doing, uh, being involved in that, you're from an experiment station, um, you can go ahead and, and, and join up for that. Okay. Okay, well this, uh, I thought I'd, after seeing uh, some of the slides this morning, Paul's and, and Krishona's and Bridget's, uh, I thought I'd uh, kind of make a little contrast here. This is a well-managed pasture. I don't think it's necessarily an equine pasture, but it's a, probably a beef cattle pasture. But it's well-managed. It looks good and fresh and lush. And uh, then I'll throw that one in. So um, uh, we want to uh, get to the point where we're managing like the first slide, not like the second slide. And unfortunately, I think we see this kind of a, a situation all too much on, uh, on equine farms, but on other farms as well, where um, the pasture really isn't managed at all. It's just a, a one great big exercise lot. A number of years ago, we did a study, and uh, Ann referred to one and, uh, earlier, and some of that data is I'm going to re repeat here plus some others, and we, we wanted to find out where our equine producers were actually getting information. And it turns out that uh, they had multiple responses on these, so uh, th that's why there's so many responses, but about, about half the participants get their information from another horse farmer. Um, some from trade mag magazines, not that many, only about a quarter of the total uh, get their information from Cooperative Extension other feed dealers, internet, other retailers. So, so a lot of it comes from uh, other horse farmers. So that's something I think we ought to bear in mind as we're working with uh, horse producers, that maybe one of the best ways of getting information out is, is, is through other people. Well, I'm looking at, as we go through the, my talk the, uh, this afternoon, look at kind of five different areas that I think that I find are important in terms of developing good best management practices. And um, first would be manure storages. Uh, then spreading and disposal of manure, managed stormwater, sacrifice area management, access to streams and waterways. And I think in general if, if, if farms kind of manage those five areas, they're going to they're gonna take care of or correct a lot of their uh, basic uh, environmental issues. That doesn't show too well. Well, in a storage, uh, uh, a study we did, and Ann referred to this as well, we found that about three quarters of the, of the equine farms in the state of New Jersey had some sort of a, a manure storage. The term we used was a designated area for manure storage. That's, you know, the status or the uh, survey person who helped us write, write this came up with that term. Now, what does that mean, designated area? Sometimes it meant an actual storage spot. Sometimes it probably meant the woods. Uh, in some cases, but they had a place where they regularly and, and uh, with some level of management kept their, kept their waste. And we followed that up with this question, how many of them, uh, where, did they, where was that manure storage located with reference to where, the, uh, where water was? Well, over 80% of them stored their manure 
over 200 feet from water, and that's, you know, that, that's good. So even though maybe there were some other BMPs related to storage that they didn't quite have right, best management practices, they were storing their manure over 200 feet from water. And also over 80% 80, 80 of them were storing their manure over, over 200 feet from a neighbor. So that, again, that indicates that although uh, some management may not have been ideal, um, it probably wasn't a real great water quality risk just because of the distance they were storing from uh, wetlands or water. Some work that was done by uh, Amy Burke at the University of Maryland, uh, she found, or they found, that uh, e even though um, there was a low adoption rate for best management practices, that they didn't feel that there was, a, in that study, they didn't feel there was a great risk to water quality because of, uh, on the horse farms. And I don't know if it was because of this reason or, or not, but they felt it was a low risk. Um, storages, well, this is one, uh, one storage that uh, we found in, the, in, in New Jersey. Um, store, uh, piled up right out in the middle of the sacrifice area, or out, in, uh, out in the middle of the dry lot. So um, piled up there, left there, got removed on a somewhat regular basis. So uh, that I would call my bad. This one's probably bordering, borderlining uh, ugly. This is a, a training facility uh, in the state where they probably trained three to four hundred standard bred horses to go to race on the tracks that were in the region, and they just pile it up, uh, as big of a pile as you could possibly imagine. Um, I, I walked across that pile, uh, and it was, it was huge. It was bigger than this room, uh, and, and they hauled it off on a regular basis. This was a, a composted area that never got turned. So uh, I think this area was probably relatively safe in terms of where it was uh, uh, in terms of water quality risk, but uh, it didn't get managed. And of course, we still see some uh, farms that uh, store manure in, a, in a, manure, uh, a manure wagon, a spreader, and haul it off on a regular basis to be to spread on their fields or to, to some other central area. This is a composting site within the state. This was a particular site was actually funded by the Natural Resources Conservation Service, or at least cost shared, uh, for them to develop the site. And this is another farm that uh, was located not too far from that one. Uh, this farm was very well managed. He, he had a nice setup, and he, he took very real, real pride in the way he did his management, and he turned that regularly, and it uh, um, managed it properly, and all of the waste he composted went, went back onto, onto his own fields. Now, this was probably the ugly. <laughs> uh, in terms of the good, the bad, and the ugly. This was located right next to a, a a diversion ditch that went right into a stream, okay? And um, they, they had taken their manure and they had, they had piled their manure in this area or out further um, into that field for as long as they could remember. And, and this was right alongside of the ditch. Now, we gave this farm some assistance, some advice, some management assistance, and they had some funding from elsewhere. And they put up this, this storage somewhat close to where that, uh, that had been, but it's uh, covered with rich gutters, and they turned in, uh, they made their own little composting facility. So they had uh, all these bins, and they turned, it, uh, turned their manure on a regular basis from bin to bin to bin. So um, they, they greatly re uh, relieved or took a, some, some of that uh, risk that they had to the water quality, uh, they removed that. And so, and at least initially anyway, uh, this is probably 15 years ago when we did this, um, greatly improved what they had. Um, I hate to tell you where this is from. I can tell that Carrie and Laura know where this is. <laughs> this is actually our own farm, Rutgers University farm. And uh, formerly this, uh, that particular barn had been a, a beef cattle operation and all the manure got stored there. Now it's horses, so um, very much inadequate storage. So we came in a, probably 10 or 12 years ago and we replaced it with this storage. Much bigger, much, much more able to contain the, the manure we had. And, and we surrounded it with a very nice uh, grass buffer. Of course, the NRCS uh, is going to require, or our state's going to requ require especially, uh, that we have a grassy buffer around our manure storages uh, to take up any, uh, when there's not a roof, that is, to take up any, any runoff that comes out of the storage. Now, this is from a, uh, um, another standard bread farm, that, uh, another training uh, facility that produced a tremendous amount of waste. 
and they really had two streams of waste. One was uh, was uh, horse manure that came out from stalls that had been bedded with, with, with straw, which this is. This got removed on a regular basis and hauled off to mushroom farmers in Pennsylvania where it was composted to make mushrooms. That, uh, however, anything that came off with shavings on that particular farm went into these piles, which uh, again are probably you know the better part of the size of this room, and it got hauled off and it got hauled out once a year. And uh, I think he told me once that the cost of removal of that was probably seventy-five thousand dollars a year. So they had no good way of of storing that manure. Uh, off to the left in the woods there was a stream, so they were a water quality problem waiting to happen. If they hadn't happened already, they just hadn't been found out um, in terms of what was happening. So at their own uh, initiative, uh, they came in and removed that manure. That's Again, that's where it was piled, but they came in and removed that, um, revegetated the area, and moved the storage to uh, another part of the, removed the storage to another part of the farm. Okay, so um, no water quality risk. It gets removed from this, uh, these uh, temporary storages on a weekly basis. So um, again, he has some, some straw bedded manure, which goes to mushroom farmers on a regular basis. And then he has a, uh, a, um, another, another storage with, with shavings that gets hauled out um, uh, on, a, on a weekly basis, or at least weekly basis, gets hauled away, keeps, keeps great records. So, um, and, and this individual did this all at his own cost. He didn't get any cost sharing. He didn't want any cost sharing. He, he wanted to do it on, on their own. So they made a great improvement. I um, want to say just a little bit about bedding, about what uh, our farms are bedding with. Uh, John Chastain did a nice presentation this morning about uh, animal bedding. I think it would be a nice comparison uh, to look at some different types of bedding. Uh, he said that mostly they uh, were using wood, wood products with the, the beddings he was using. As I mentioned, a lot of straw bedding might, might end up going to mushroom farms. But um, he was looking at the avail availability of in, uh, in, uh, for nitrogen uptake in plants. In our study, uh, over, half the, over half of the producers were using some sort of a, of a wood product. About 25% were using straw. This is a study we did about uh, five or seven years ago where we compared uh, four different types of bedding in a stall, in stalls. Strufex, maybe some of you are familiar with that. That's a pelleted straw product. Um, just regular straw, wood shavings, and woody pet, which is a pelleted wood product. And maybe some of you are in the industries are, are familiar with these different products. We really liked the Strufex. We found that it was uh, um, maybe not perfect in the stalls, but relatively uh, acceptable. Um, we probably added less, less uh, of the Strufex in the stalls than we did of, of the others. And, um, and we found that um, when we compared those four different types, we liked the way the Strufex composted. It composted very well, better than any of the other types, particularly the, the shavings or the straw. It, it, it composted a lot better. So I think there's a lot of research that could be done in bedding, different bedding types and their utilization um, on, on horse farms. Strufex is not always real, ava real available, but, uh, but, but we were able to, to obtain it. Again, most horse farms that I'm familiar with, if they have the opportunity, they're going to want to use horse. They're going to want to use wood shavings, although we do have a lot who are interested in woody pet. It's a wood pellet. Okay, a few words about spreading and disposal. Um, I'll go through that pretty quickly. It's just a uh, comparing. Uh, it's kind of counterintuitive what we found in terms of that survey, the survey, based on the number of horses. Um, the more horses they had, the less likely they were to spread manure. So the fewer horses they had, the, the, the more likely uh, they were to spread manure. And um, with the more horses they uh, had, the more likely they were to have a manure storage. Okay, do you dispose of manure off farm? About 40% disposed manure off farm. And um, it, in the worst case, uh, such, a, such as this, this, this gentleman does total, total clean-outs for people. Okay, so if, a problem, if, if manure's been uh, left uh, un, unmanaged in a place for a long period of time, he would come into that area and he would totally clean it out. He'd take it to his own composting operation, haul it away, sometimes in a truck, a big roll-off. And um, 
in his particular situation, he took, the, he took that uh, horse manure and he mixed it with uh, fruit and vegetable waste and he composted it. And he had a very nice system for composting, a uh, very nice market for what he did. And ultimately, a lot of his product went to land, uh, landscapers. Some of it was uh, uh, disposed of with, uh, bagged and went to stores. Unfortunately, his best market is not with, with horse farms because a lot of the horse farms he would like to work with, they don't really want to pay the tipping fee they might have to pay to, uh, to dispose of their manure with him. So a lot of what he takes is uh, uh, supermarket and vegetable waste, although I think he still does the, the total cleanouts on farms. Unfortunately, that's all too common in, in certain parts of our state. People actually disposing of their manure directly into a dumpster, hauled away. Um, how many horse, uh, horse owners spread the manure on the farm? Um, we found a little over half did, or at least they said that they did. I'm not sure how well they actually incorporated into um, uh, any kind of a nutrient management plan, but we have a couple other slides to look at, to look at that. Do you use manure as a fertilizer to meet crop needs? Uh, about 40% said they did. Um, now I'm going to guess in our state that might have varied a little bit from area to area in the state. In the northern part of the state, we've got more um, smaller acreages, not a lot of land for spreading. The southern part of the state might have some larger uh, acreages. Maybe they have a multiple operations. Maybe they have beef cows, and, and in that area, there might have been more spreading of uh, more spreading of manure. How often do you do soil tests? 32% uh, said they did soil testing on a regular basis. I'm not sure, we didn't ask how often they did it, but they, at least with some regular regularity, they, they, uh, um, they did soil tests. Almost everybody, or 75%, drag harrowed, and that's a, a good management practice that we, will, we often recommend, that um, you break up manure clumps and make uh, um, those parasites that might be there a little bit more uh, accessible to the sunlight. Um, break up the nutrients. So that's definitely a, a, a practice we'd recommend and it's going to improve the fertility of the soil as well as we, as we break that up. So we, we do have some people in the state that are accounting for the, for the nutrient value within, uh, within horse manure and, and spreading it and management, managing it that way. And um, this is actually one of our uh, program associates who's, who's, uh, who's doing this work. Um, and, you know, a lot of people will have these little tiny Mill Creek spreader, spreaders that they use to, uh, to spread manure on a small, small acreage. Okay, well, healthy crops uh, use more nutrients. I mentioned that earlier. And um, we're not going to take up too many nutrients when we, uh, either from the horses that spread the manure on a pasture like this, or, um, or that we spread manure on. Managing stormwater. Again, this, uh, this ditch went right through the middle of a, of a pasture. It, it, it was probably draining stormwater runoff that was came, coming off of the stable area, the barn area. And again, it was heading directly towards the, that tree line in the back where there was a stream. Now, this, is a, um, this was a, uh, a standard bred uh, operation where they had done, taken a lot of uh, initiative, a lot of care in terms of how they, they manage their animal. They manage their animals and they manage their animal waste. They had mostly standard breads. They had a few beef cattle as well. And um, he's given a very nice buffer here off of his fields that are um, to, to keep storm water, to keep runoff uh, out, of, out of that stream. Now this, uh, maybe you've seen this slide before. I'm not sure where I got this slide. Chris abrupt a slide. Um, and uh, you know, that, th there's a ditch running right through that, uh, that sacrifice area that lot and anytime there's rain it's going to just run that uh, uh, any erosion that's possible there's going to go right going to go right through that that area so that's uh, again there we go to the ugly okay that's uh, I showed you that slide earlier but this is uh, this is well managed area around the outside of that uh, that uh, storage area well vegetated takes up lots of nutrients this one it has to it has a 35 foot uh, length, I believe, is what we have at the back of this before it gets to to other uh, pastures. In this in this case, okay, storm drains coming off roofs. Again, this is one of the the, the standard bred farm I mentioned earlier, and um, this this particular individual took a lot of his management very much seriously. So what he did what he did is he had. Um, these storm pipes coming off all of his, 
all of his barns. He excavated below that probably six feet, and he filled it with um, gravel. So, um, and all the water went into that. Hopefully, and the goal was to get some sort of a groundwater recharge uh, from his, uh, from his uh, rainwater that was coming off roofs. And he'd done that on just about every barn he had on the farm. Expensive alternative, but it worked for him. Okay, sacrifice lots, we talked about those a little bit this morning. And I think we learned a little bit from our NRCS folks about, uh, in this case, 47% um, of our farmers said they had a sacrifice lot or a rest area, an exercise lot. I think they all got, the, I think everybody knew pretty much what we were asking when we asked that question. So 47% said they had a specialized lot that animals could use possibly as part of a rotational grazing system. And that's what I mean by a uh, sacrifice lot here, that, that uh, corral area in the center where animals have permanent access to that area. And um, from that, they can access each of those pastures rotationally. Put that one in there enough, okay. Feeders, now I know Krishona is gonna talk with us later today about uh, feeder management and mud management. Now, it's great that, the, that they had elevated feeders here, um, but oftentimes, uh, you know, when the, a lot of that feed's gonna be able to uh, contaminate, uh, gonna get contaminated in that mud. Here's a, pretty well managed sacrifice lot, or at least at this point in time, this, this farm was well managed. Okay, let's see. And finally, controlling uh, animal access to streams and waterways. Um, obviously, we don't want to, if we can uh, work away from this, we definitely want to. Sometimes uh, watering areas are needed for animals that are in rotational areas or pastures and we want to be able to fence animals off when we can. Just a couple comments about feeding, uh, feeding management. This is a study by Harper, and I think, Ann, you're familiar with this. They found that horses were fed 159% um, of their uh, nitrogen requirements and 185% of their phosphorus requirements. So there was a lot of overfeeding taking place in those, in those horses. So that's another best management practice that we need to be concerned about uh, to, to properly uh, um, manage that. Now, there's a, there's a very good poster next door that Dr. Williams and uh, uh, Laura Kenny and myself worked on where we t where that's the subject of the poster about feeding management on, on horses. And we found a very variety of things that uh, affect feeding management. And you might want to take a look at that. And if you want to talk to Carrie about it, I'm sure she'd be, I'm sure she'd be willing to do that. Um, And we also act, asked people in another uh, survey, where do they get their nutritional advice? Well, about 15% had no plan at all. A certain amount used a feed store, very few used a consultant. Many people did it on their own. Um, hardly anybody used extension. And then a number used a veter uh, veterinarian. Of course, this is kind of controversial. If you ask a nutritionist, they'll say they should never use a veterinarian. But um, uh, I wouldn't, certainly wouldn't want to be quoted on that one. <laughs> Um, and they'd say the same thing, I'm sure. But um, uh, so the, it's across the board. And if you uh, if if you talk to Carrie about the poster uh, n next door, you find that there's a lot of variability in the in the horse producers. And and like uh, Betsy or Ann said this morning, um, this pa this this animal's Flicka, this animal's Black Black Beauty. Well, Flicka gets rice, Black Beauty gets oil. Um, this one gets two supplements, that one gets four supplements. So um, if, if you're looking at a nutrient management program with, say, dairy, you, you, you were looking at a, a group of maybe several hundred cows in that group, or with swine or beef, the same thing. But with horse, every, every, uh, every individual horse is different. So to actually be controlling diets on those animals, it's a, it's a challenge, that uh, uh, more of a challenge than with other species. Okay, this is, um, uh, this is kind of my um, last comment here, and then I'm gonna go into a little bit of a case study on a farm we, we worked on. Uh, we should focus on the implementation of low-cost management practices that equine farmers are likely to adopt. I, I, that's, I've been saying that for a while, and I think other people have too, that a lot of um, management practices, a lot of horse farmers are not gonna likely do, especially smaller farms, um, some kinds of stables, so we, but there are some low-cost management practices 
I think it was uh, one of the NRCS people this morning mentioned covering a manure pile with a tarp. Something that simple can, uh, um, I know it was John Chastain mentioned that. Something that simple can, you know, can keep some of the nutrients in the pile and it can probably help a little bit with runoff. So um, I think that's a, a good thing for us to focus on in the future. Okay, well, um, beginning about three and a half years ago, um, myself and Dr. Williams and Laura, we worked on a farm in, in central New Jersey, and, and, and this is the farm. I think I can see it from the right angle here. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and it was a, one of the problems with it, this, this particular farm had been in existence as a horse farm since probably the 1870s. And um, if you go through um, that one side of the farm there, you go there and you find a lot of headstones, graves, headstones to some of the, what they thought were famous horses that had lived there. And um, so they actually had a track there that had been there since the 1870s. So there wasn't a, the, the, the township wanted to, or the, the county wanted to keep this particular farm in operation. It had probably 50 to 60 horses on about 20, 25 acres. Everything, it was very poorly managed. It was a rental facility, uh, not managed by the owner. So, you know, everything is kind of the perfect storm there for getting something that's probably not very well managed. And it wasn't uh, well managed. You see that area up at the top, the, um, the buildings at the top, and on just you see a tree line there. Well, there was a stream right through that tree line, uh, that stream right there probably about 15 feet from, the, from, from some lots. And that's what happened to that stream at times when they had a, a, a heavy rains. It went right through the, what, what the, was their pony lot is what it was. Went right through that lot. And uh, this was a pony lot when there wasn't a, a, a rainstorm event that was causing all that uh, water to come through. So, um, you know, you can see just down at the bottom where the rain, where the, where the water is. And again, the, 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 the renter on this facility wasn't really interested in uh, doing a lot of management. He didn't have to do, he'd have to pay for. And at the same time, the, t the township wanted to maintain the historical nature of this farm. So um, they got some, uh, some support, the county did, uh, from uh, 319H funding from, the, uh, from, the, from our state DEP, which is federal, federal dollars, to do some improvements on the farm. And we were involved in giving some assistance, particularly in helping them develop management plans and making advice on how they should uh, develop a sacrifice area. Well, they, they, they cleared out that area where the ponies had been, which was such a muddy mess, uh, and they put in a, a, a nice sacrifice area where they went in and excavated. I think we used Betsy's, uh, some of your literature on how to properly do that. And they came up with a nice area to, to keep their animals. They excavated all around the, the track uh, uh, to, to get some of the water out of the, out of the infield of the track. Spent a lot of money doing it, of course. Um, actually had to, some of the areas that were worse in terms of uh, wetlands or in water logging, they, they uh, fenced out everything. Uh, manure storage is something they, that remains to be completed on the farm. You can see here it's uh, um, pretty much of a mess. I didn't include some pictures that would have been far worse than this. And the area where that uh, had been uh, the pony lot in the past, uh, this is what they've done with it now, which was a sacrifice area. Um, now they've uh, revegetated it and they've put in all these trees. Uh, this is what the, the farm had looked like previously. Here you can see a different angle of what it looks like now. Um, they've moved all the fences up. There's still an area in the center here where they're, they've got some, they're, they've still got some mud accumulation, but that area in the corner, which was such a mess, it's been revegetated. Um, the new sacrifice lot we put in was up here on the left. They put in was up here on the left. All right, and that's.